And so over the past three weeks, we have been in a series called GPS. And we've talked about how really this is a vision series for our church, but not only our church, but it should be a vision series for every believer. Because when you look at scripture, these are three areas in your life that you see uh, in the early church and, and the way that Jesus uh, raised his disciples and the way the disciples led the church early on that were necessary. We've talked about groups and the importance of small groups and discipleship and, and, and community that takes place in groups. We talked about prayer last week and the importance of not just praying for the things that we need, but praying for others and, and uh, praying for God's will to be done in our life and through our life that, and, and taking the time to spend time in his word and in his presence so that he can speak to us and give us a direction for each day. You know, scripture says that every day of our life was uh, written out in his book before we even lived one, then do we take the time to ask him what was his plan for the day? And hopefully you guys have been in the word and in prayer seeking God on a daily basis for his will to be done. And today we're going to talk about serving. But we've kind of started looking at this in Acts chapter 2 with the church, and, and we're going to pick back up there again. This is a scripture that we've looked at uh, every week in this series, and we're going to look at it again, and then we're going to go a little bit past it. And it's Acts chapter 2, verse 42. It says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. And then uh, an awe came upon every soul. Now, when did the awe come upon every soul? I think this is important. It came upon when they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, when they were devoted to fellowship with one another, when they were devoted to prayer, when, when there was a, a unity and a camaraderie and a community that was within the church where people were focused on God and his plan and will for their life, then there was all these miraculous things that take place. And an awe came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were done through the apostles. And all who believed were together. And they had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings, distributing them, uh, distributing the proceeds to any that had need. Now, when you begin to look at that, like that is kind of a next level as far as a desire to meet the needs that are in your community. You know, it's one thing if like you give a little bit of money toward a cause or you give a little money toward an outreach or, or something that's going on. It's a whole nother thing when not only do you give a little bit of your resources that you have, but if you don't have enough to meet the need, you're going to go sell land or homes or, or cars or whatever to be able to meet the needs of other people that are in your life or in your community. And that's how connected this church was. They, they didn't just attend together in one room or one place. They were so committed to one another that if I had a need, then and you didn't have the needs quite to be able to do it, but you had something that you could sell to help me meet the need, that you would do that. Now, I know there, there are people who would do this for family and things. I, I know a man who's a business owner. He's a successful business owner. He's got a, a grandson that has cancer and has been battling cancer for years. And uh, they've tried all kinds of different treatments, and they haven't worked. And there was a new promising treatment that came out uh, to help, that, that could potentially help his grandson. And, and, but insurance or nobody would cover the cost of it. And it was not a cheap thing. And I watched how this grandpa was doing anything and everything. He, he was selling land. Like There was even one point where there was a piece of land that we were kind of interested in. He was like, just make me an offer on it. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not worried about the amount. I, I've got to get the resources I need to be able to pay for my grandsons. Now, now, I understand doing that within, like, your physical family. And most of us probably would do that. If, if there was somebody in our family that had a huge need, we would do whatever we could to be able to meet the need. But they weren't just doing it with their blood family. They were doing that with their church family. There was that level of a connection and a devotion and a community that they had within it that, that whatever is mine, it says that all things were together as one. That, that, that it wasn't 
there wasn't selfishness of mine and, and everything. It was just like, if, if I have it and you need it, it's yours. That type of community. Now, that shows one thing that was definitely within this church. And that shows that there was a love for one another. And I think that that is one of the things that many times we lack when we just come to church. Because when you just come to church and you see somebody and you talk about the weather, you talk about the ball games that happened the other day, or you just talk kind of generically about life, like there's not a major connection that's made in, the, in those superficial type conversations. This love and this deep community that they had for one another came because they were praying for one another. It came because they, they were interested in what was going on in one another's lives. They were studying the word of God together. They were praying. They, there was a spiritual connection in everything that was there. And because of the groups and, and because of the devotion to prayer and because of the devotion to fellowship, now there was a, a devotion to whatever your need is, I'm, if I have any way possible to be able to meet this need, I'm going to be able to meet that need. It goes on in verse 46, and it says, and day by day, they attended in the temple together, and they broke bread together in their homes. We've talked about this before, that is this right here, meeting in the temple or the church, is not it when it comes to church. And then on the other hand, there's some people who are more home church driven. Meeting together in a home is great and there's connection and there's fellowship, but there also needs to be a connection to the temple and the corporate body of Christ as well. They didn't do one or the other. They did both together. They attended temple together. They broke bread together in their homes. They received their food with glad and generous hearts. They praised God, and they had favor with all the people. And because of this, verse 47, it says that the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I think one of the biggest problems that we have in the church world, especially in America, is that we view church as week by week. And for some people, it's not even week by week. They're, they're bi-weekly. Or they might even be on the monthly basis. Like they, they come and get their God once a month and their, their community service, you know, in there once a month. Or, or when they're put on nursery to serve in nursery, they come and they do that. But listen, we need relationship and connection more than week by week. They did it day by day. And because they were willing to invite God in day by day, God was willing to answer with miraculous things day by day. If we want to see the day by day miracles, we have to invite God into our day by day life. Not our personal day by day life. I'm talking about our corporate body day by day life. That we have got to begin to connect with each other. Now, it doesn't mean that every day you have to be connected in a small group or every day you have to be connected in, in, in a church building. Like that, that isn't necessarily what it's saying, but there needs to be connection and, and things to where day by day you can reach out and call if there's a struggle, if there's something going on, even if it's just a text group that you can encourage one another through scripture or reach out and say, hey, I'm struggling, I need some prayer today. And then other believers come around them and say, hey, I'm praying for you and give instruction or whatever. There needs to be some sense of community and technology or, uh, that, that we have that, that can take place through technology or however it is, but it needs to take place on a day-by-day -day basis. Not a week-by-week, -week, not a monthly you see, when you look at this, the reason why you see all these salvations added was simply because the presence of God was always there. You see, what they had and what the early church had is really what all of us seek. Yeah, every person wants to be a part of a group. Every person wants to be a part of a family. Every person wants to have a pack of people that they can connect in with that they have relationship with. 
The one thing that God said wasn't good when he created things was it wasn't good that man would be alone. And so what did he do? He created a helpmate to be with him, to go through life with him. But a lot of times, even in our marriages, we don't have that connection even with our spouse. Where we day by day carry one another's uh, needs, where we day by day encourage one another, where we day by day pray with one another. Listen, if you can't do it on a, a scale with other believers and stuff, then at least start in, ho- in your own home, day by day with your family, day by day with your spouse, day by day with your children, being there to meet needs and stuff. Why? Because it's a sense of community. That's why people even join gangs and things like this. It's because they'll go through initiations and be beat down and, and all of these things just so that they can fill a part of a group. That's why teenagers will compromise and do things that they never wanted to do and they, 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 they never would even see themselves doing because they want to be a part of a group. And it's the same thing. The people that are lost, if they see us as part of a group and they see the family feel and they see the connectivity that is within us, then they will want to be a part of what we're a part of. But it's not just holding hands and praying together. It's it's the very fact of when there's a need in my life, you're there to serve. When there's a need in your life, I'm there to serve because we're brothers and sisters. We are connected in everything. There's community. They had, they had a commitment to one another, to, to prayer, and to a commitment to the word of God. So there's this, not only a connection of community, but there's a connection to God and a connection to others that comes through that. And then they had love for one another to the point of, Mickey, if you have a need, and I've got some tools or something that I can sell, and I can sell this and make enough money to meet your need, then I'm not. Tools are nothing. They can be replaced. I'm going to get rid of these things, and I'm going I'm to help Mickey out. They had love for one another. They had compassion. See, if we're going to grow as a church and we're going to see the church grow and we're going to see the church grow day by day, then there needs to be a commitment to community. There needs to be a commitment to connection with God and each other. And there needs to be compassion that flows through us to people that are lost and that are hurting. And serving should be motivated not by trying to find position, not by trying to please God and just check off a to-do list. You know, I think a lot of people mainly just serve out of obligation. And that's why when they get frustrated with the person that they're serving under or whatever, they no longer feel obligated to serve, so they don't serve. But serving should be motivated by love. Serving should be motivated by compassion. When you look at the life of Jesus, that's exactly what you see. In Matthew chapter 9, you see Jesus. It talks about how Jesus was moved with compassion. Verse 35, it says, Jesus went out throughout all the cities and the villages, and he was teaching in the synagogues, and he was proclaiming the gospel. But he wasn't just teaching. He wasn't just doing a spiritual act. But it said he was healing every disease and affliction. So what was he? He sees a need, and he's meeting the need. He knows that he has the ability to pray to his father and his father would answer him and and provide the need. And so he goes and he lays hands on them and he prays and he lifts them up and he brings healing into their life. It says, and then when he saw crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and they were helpless. They were like sheep without a shepherd. And if you go look up that word compassion, in the Greek, there's a couple different words that they typically are used for the word compassion there. One of them is splachon. You got to kind of cough up some phlegm when you say it. Like, if you turn to your neighbor and say splachon and you didn't spit a loogie in their eye, you probably didn't say it right. <laughs> but the other one is splognizomai, and they, they come from the same root word. And splognizomai literally means from the bowels, or from the deepest part. And I think it's interesting how your videos just always go along with part of the sermon. 
that wasn't even planned. That was just like, hey, Aaron, just go film three funny things and let's. But the same way at first, it was like, I need a nice, clean restroom. Oh, no, no, no. I, I'll take any rest. I'll take a dirt. I will take a wide spot, a tree. Just find a tree to cover myself. Like, why? Because when you start feeling movement from the bowels, you've got to find some way to release it. Come on, let's be honest here. And basically, that's the picture. Like when Jesus was moved with compassion, it wasn't something that he could just sit on. When he began to see the hurt and the pain, these are sheep without shepherds. These are people who have been harassed. These are people who are helpless in their sin. These are people who are stuck. It wasn't something that they could be like, oh, we just got to pray for them, Pastor Jonathan. Oh, Lord, bless them, Lord. Them heathens, they need Jesus, Lord. Now, you got to move. Like you got to find some way. And that's what you see. He saw hurting people. He saw harassed people. He saw helpless people. And he wasn't just going to leave them where they were. He was going to do whatever it took to meet the need. If they needed a physical healing, he was going to heal them. If they needed a demon cast out of them, he was going to cast a demon out of them. If they hadn't heard the gospel of, Je- of, the gospel of God and the truth of Jesus and, and his love, and everything, he was going to present it. Whatever it took, whatever he needed, he was going to meet the need. And then you look at what that... The, the early church did. The disciples led the same way. If there's a need, we're going to meet it. Whatever it is, we're going to meet the spiritual needs. We're going to meet the physical needs. If, if, you know, there's a man begging at the gate called Beautiful, and he, he's been there the whole time. He's going to meet the physical healing of that man and, and reach down. He's not just going to give him a coin. He's got something greater than a coin. He's got connection to God and the power of God that can flow through him to bring healing. He's not going to stop with a little handout. He's going to meet the real need that's going on. And when the church begins to stop looking at, at things that are around us as inconveniences and as, as things that, that, that nothing can be done about and realize that we have the answer to what they need. They need the Jesus that is inside of us. And we're going to show that by our love. We're going to show that by serving. That's why I said, like, our food trucks, like, we don't want to just give food to someone. Because there are soup kitchens and there are all kinds of things where they can get a meal and have somebody just give food to them. We want to connect with them, to be able to pray with them. We want to see what's going on in their life. Is there something that we can meet a need? Is there some way that we can serve you? Is there, is there some type of advice that we can give? Is there something that we have inside of you beyond the food to be able to really meet the need that you're going on, going, that's going on in your life? That's why we've got to begin to truly begin to look out for the interests of others and not just ourselves. I think sometimes we're so busy with life and we're so busy with our interests and the things that concern us that we totally forget that there are people who are in far worse shape and need than what we have right now and what we're in right now. And Jesus, even when he needed solitude, even when he wanted to just get away and pray, in in Matthew chapter 14, he had just heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded and he died. And you look at Jesus' response, even in the middle of his own pain, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 13, it says, when Jesus heard, this is talking about when John, he heard that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he withdrew from the boat to a desolate desolate place by himself. He just, he wanted to go pray. He just wanted, I mean, John the Baptist was a relative. John the Baptist was a friend. John the Baptist was a man who had paved the way for him. I mean, he just wanted to be able to process and be able to grieve that moment and everything. Because even though, yes, he was uh, fully God, he was also fully human. He felt grief. He felt sorrow. He felt pain. And he's just trying to get away. And the crowds heard it and they followed him on foot from the towns. 
And he went ashore and he saw the great crowd that was there. And here it is again. He had compassion on them. He couldn't just see a need and not meet it. Even though he was heartbroken, even though he was hurting, he had to look past his own personal pain and see the pain that was going on in other people's lives. He said he had compassion on them and then he healed them. He met their needs. He put the needs of others higher than himself. That's what Paul wrote in several different places. In Romans chapter 12, he says you need to prefer others as better than yourself. In Ephesians chapter 2, he said you need to not just look out for the interests of others, but you need to have the same mindset that Christ did. Or not just look out for your own interests, but have the same mindset that Christ did, that he looked out for the interests of others. When you do a self-evaluation in your life, how well do we do at this? You know, we talk about the way to find joy is Jesus, others, and you. But why is it so many times when we're hurting, we forget about others? We go back to that Jio versus that joy. And then it's in those moments that we really find like when we become more centered on ourself, we become more depressed. We find ourselves more like just struggling, like to even, why am I going through life? I mean, anybody ever felt this before? Like, start feeling sorry for yourself and you don't even want to be around others and Because, like we talked about in that first series of the year, we gotta, we got to live that upside-down life. The life that we see with Jesus. Why is it that Jesus, when he sees the needs of others, even though he's in pain himself, and this isn't far from when he's looking forward to the cross and things. Even as he's getting ready to go to the cross, you see another place where he sets his eyes toward Jerusalem. He's going and starts seeing the needs of others. And even though he's getting ready to be beaten and humiliated and mocked and everything, he begins to go and heal the sick and preach to others. It's because Jesus didn't see these people. I'm just trying to get some peace. Would you please just be quiet? Could you, like, go take your needs somewhere else. He didn't see them as an inconvenience. He saw him as sheep without shepherds. He saw himself and referred to himself as the good shepherd. So if he had the ability to shepherd these sheep and they didn't have a shepherd, then he was going to meet the need. I think one thing, because many times we put ministry as based on whoever is standing up here on the altar or whoever is sitting up here on the altar or whatever, that... That's the shepherd. That's the pastor. But we don't realize that my responsibility is to equip you for the work of the ministry so that you can shepherd your home, so that you can shepherd your community in your workplace, so that you can shepherd your small groups, so that you can shepherd the group of people that you're connected to. And if we can begin to see ourselves as we have some answers, we have something inside of us that other people may not have. And so we, we have been shepherded and we are under shepherds of the good shepherd. Then we can help shepherd the people who have no shepherds. Does that make sense? It's a whole lot of shepherding <laughs> for people who don't have sheep. <laughs> but he saw the need. He saw the hurt, and he knew he had the ability to fill it. And he goes back to that Matthew 9. After he said that, he didn't finish there. Pull up verse 37. It says, and then he looked to his disciples, and he said, listen, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. So therefore, earnestly pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Now, you look in the book of Acts, you see that they reaped a daily harvest. Why? 
because they weren't looking at this. Like, this is what Jesus even, at, at one, another place when he was telling this story, was actually uh, with the, uh, and I think it's in John 4, with the woman at the well, the, the Samaritan woman. And, and he, he says this same phrase to his disciples in, in that moment when they're all there and, and all the, the, you know, she had left and she's bringing back all these Samaritans and he looks at him and says, look, the field is white with the harvest. And they're like, where? All we see is a bunch of Samaritans around here. Like, we're Jews, they're Samaritans, we don't like them. They couldn't even see that it was a harvest. And I think for too long, sometimes the church just sees the world in their sin. Where's, they're just sinners. That's just a bunch of prostitutes. That's just a bunch of strippers. That's just a bunch of drug addicts. That's just a bunch of whatever. And so we belittle who they are and the humanity of where they, who they are by putting some type of label on them. We have to understand this. If our sin doesn't define who we are, but Christ defines who we are, then why should, do, should we identify other people by their sin? And if we know that Christ can identify who they are, then why are we not leading them to Christ so that they can find their true identity? And there's a whole lot about identity crisis in the world today, and People not knowing their identity in all kinds of different ways. Well, if we knew our identity, then we would know that our job is to help them find their identity in Christ. And a lot of times the thing that's going to open the doors is not us preaching at them, but us serving them. And that gives us the opportunity to speak into their lives. I love this. My wife and, and a bunch of women uh, the other night, my, my uh, Melody told me, she's like, I got to get up at about one o'clock in the morning. And, and uh, I was like, what you going to do? Go out partying? She's like, no, we're, we're going out. Uh, we're meeting uh, some of the dancers from Southern Exposure after they get off their shift. And we're going to go take them to the omelet shop or Waffle House or whatever the name of the place is up there. And we're going to have breakfast with them and spend time with them. Now, a Pharisee would look at him because this is like, why would you hang out with those people? Isn't it Jesus who said, when they were saying that about him hanging out with the tax collectors and the, the, uh, and the sinners, he's like, well, and they started saying, he's like, well, who is it that needs a doctor? Is it the, the healthy or the sick? And for too long, we've used scripture that says, come out from among the world and be separate as a way and an excuse not to serve people who are far from him. Because we're afraid of their sin cooties instead of realizing that the blood of Jesus that is on our life is greater than any sin. And if we'll just get out there and begin to serve them and meet the needs that they have, that the power inside of us is greater than the power inside of them, and we can let the power inside of us transform them. Jesus set the ultimate example of servanthood, even all the way up until the end when he's preparing for the cross. In John 13, he takes the towel and he gets down and he washes their feet. In John 13, 12, he says that after he had washed their feet, he put back on his outer garments and he said to them, do you understand what I've done to you? He said, you call me teacher and Lord, and you're right to do so because I am. But if I, your teacher and your Lord, have washed your feet, then shouldn't you wash one another's feet? Now, this is something like I grew up in an old small church, a lot of smaller churches and stuff. And, and, and I, I don't know if y'all ever been a part of one of the, you ever been a part of a feet washing service? <laughs> it's not washing. It's washing. We're going to wash each other's feet. Come on, anybody, y'all been a part of that? That is like one of them, like, I got to do what? Like, like, I'm always trying to, like, partner up with my brother or my cousin Jeremy. It's like, okay, like, I can touch your feet, I guess, you know. At least I don't want to touch nobody else's feet, you know. 
If I said we're going to have a feet washing service, that would be the least attended service of the year. That would even be less than like a prayer and fasting service, like low attendance that week. Why? They don't know where their feet have been. It could be fungus on it. It be toe cheese and all this nastiness. Get my hands in all that. You do realize that Jesus is washing animal dung off of his disciples' feet. And he said, if I'm willing to get my hands dirty, you need to be willing to get your hands dirty. I think it's time the church stops worrying about getting our hands dirty and starts realizing that what Jesus said in verse 15, he said, I have given you an example of what you should do. But truly I say to you, no servant is greater than their master, and no messengers are greater than the one who sent them. And if you know these things, you are blessed. He didn't stop there, did he? You're not just blessed for knowing that you're supposed to serve. <laughs> you're not blessed until you do it. Now, we all want the blessings of the Lord on our life. We're going to have a service, and we're just going to pray for God's blessing upon our life and everything. Yes, Lord. Everybody pack in for that service. But Jesus said the blessing comes when you're willing to serve and not be served. Are you willing to get into the mess in other people's life? Do we love people enough? to be willing to get our hands dirty. Paul challenged the church in Corinth, and he told them this. He said, let all that you do, let all that you do be done in love. Whatever you do. If you're serving in the nursery and you're holding a child, let it be done with love. If you're opening the door for someone, let it be done with great love. If you're mowing grass for a widow, let it be done with love. If you're cooking food, let it be done with love. If Whatever it is, let it be done with love. The way the NLT puts it is this way. Do everything with love. The, the Amplified, I love this part. Because he, it always enhances it a little bit. It says, let everything that you do be done in love. The love that is motivated and inspired by God. It's love for us. How did God love us? That's how we need to love others. Will we follow his example and serve? You know, even within the church, there's so much of wanting. There's, even within ministry, like this desire to climb a ladder of success in ministry. Like if I'm a, if I serve, then they might bring me on church staff, and then they might make me a youth pastor. If I serve there long enough, then they might make me an associate pastor. Then once I'm an associate pastor, then I can go be a senior pastor somewhere. And I can, I can go, vote, go be the lead guy. And we even see, like, people craving ministry for that desire. I'm called to be an evangelist, so let me just send out business cards and letters. And, and just everybody needs to know that I'm available so that I can go evangelize and preach and everything. i gotta I got to build a name for myself. got to build some followers on Instagram. So that when I write my book, I can have a publisher so that I have enough followers to have people that would buy my book. And I believe Jesus would look at that mentality and be like, guys, y'all don't get it. You just don't get it. Being the greatest in the kingdom doesn't mean that you're the pastor of the church doesn't mean that you're the head of a denomination it doesn't mean any of those things 
Matthew 23, 11 says, the greatest among you will be your servant. He who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. The one who is the greatest in the kingdom is the one who is a servant to them all, not being served by all. In fact, he rebukes his disciples. He tells them, listen, the Gentiles lord their leadership over people and want people to serve them. It shouldn't be that way among you. But instead, you need to desire the role of a servant. And that's why Jesus' last message that he did was an illustrated message to his, his disciples. Even if it means doing, because washing the feet of the people when they would come in the house, that was for the lowest servant that was in the house. Say, so even if it means taking the lowest spot to serve, even I, your Lord and teacher, have done that. And you need to follow my example. That's why you see the church so willing to serve is because that was what Jesus had taught his disciples. And I guarantee you, part of the disciples' teaching, when it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, he's teaching them about servanthood. He's teaching them about, about uh, not, being, not trying to be the greatest, but to be the servant of them all. He, he's, that was the last message that Jesus had taught. You know what the last prayer that he prayed was? Before, Father, forgive them for they not, know not what they do. The last prayer that he prayed with his disciples, God, I pray that you will make them one as I and, and the Spirit and Father, as we are one, I pray that you will make them one and that there will be unity among them. And you look at the early church. They are committed day by day to the Word, to each other, to fellowship. Why, they, were, they were there because they wanted to be an answer to Jesus' prayer for unity. It's one thing to pray and say we want to see a revival. It's another thing to do the things necessary to see the revival. And I believe if you've listened to these three sermons, you will see that we need to be connected to one another in groups. We need to be connected to one another in prayer. And we need to be connected in one another and serving one another and serving our community. And when you see these things, the world will be awed at the miracles and things that take place. There will be salvations that take place day by day. When we move God from a weekly appointment to a daily appointment, when we move our, our weekly appointment or monthly appointment with our groups to a daily appointment, appointment where we're checking in with one another, praying with one another, encouraging one another. That is when we're going to see the revival that we all desire. And I hope that we allow this series to be a GPS that recalculates and gets us as individuals, as families, and as a church back on the path that God has for us.